I coordinate the uh, Village Voices for Capitol Hill Village. And before we do the program, a couple of announcements and some thanks. Thanks, of course, to May Jean Daniels, who does the publicity for us. Thanks to Mary Bloodworth, who is doing tech support for us behind the scene. Thanks to Judy Berman, who always supports these kinds of programs. As you've just seen on your screen, I think there is a recording in progress. Uh, we do post these with the permission of the speaker after uh, the program is over. So if you have friends or family who have missed this uh, session, tell them to wait and look for it on the website of the village. Um, we would ask you to mute yourselves all during the presentation. When we come to the question and answer, you've got a couple of options. One is, of course, you can use the raise hand function. Mary will try to help us watch for those. Uh, and, or you can write your question into the chat box. And the chat is very helpful during the program. If uh, Avis is talking and you'd like to ask a question and you're going to forget it by the time she's finished, just use the chat and put your question in there, please. I should also mention we have two new programs coming up. Uh, our December program will be on Monday the 13th, and it's Ellen Farrell, and she will be talking about early Renaissance music, playing us some uh, examples and taking us into the holiday season. And then in January, and we don't have the date quite fixed yet, Connie Citro will be coming back again to talk about what we did learn out of the 2020 census and how that is now affecting our politics. So that's the upcoming, the next two upcoming events with us and we hope you'll join us. Now to our uh, presenter this evening is Avis Bolan. Many of you know her. She's a distinguished foreign service officer. She was our ambassador to Bulgaria. She was the assistant secretary for arms control in the State Department. She's well known as an expert on arms control, security policy in the Soviet Union from the time when it was a Soviet Union. Originally, I asked her to talk about her specialties and she said, no, she'd rather talk about her extremely distinguished father also a Foreign Service Officer par exemplar. And so we have invited her indeed to join us and talk about her father, Charles Chip Bowler. Avis, the Zoom room is yours. Thank you, Trudy. I'm very happy to be here with you this evening and, and many thanks to Trudy for uh, inviting me and for giving me a chance to talk about my father, Charles, or Chip Bolin, as he was called all his life. Probably most of you know something about him, perhaps only in a general way, as someone who was active during the Cold War years. He was certainly a much better known figure during his lifetime than he is today. So what makes him worth talking about today? One important reason, and I will focus really on this a lot, is that he, with George Kennan, was one of the top Soviet experts of his era at a time when few in the US knew much about the Soviet Union. He was also a skilled diplomat who was highly respected at home and abroad by West European and Soviet officials alike. In addition, he had the good fortune to live at a particularly important juncture in history, to be a witness, as he phrased it, of the period spanning America's pre-war isolation through World War II and the first years of the Cold War. As an interpreter for Roosevelt at the wartime conferences of Tehran and Yalta, and for Truman at Potsdam, he was privileged to observe three historic figures, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill at close quarters. He experienced, indeed participated in the transformation of America's role in the world from isolationism to global leadership and played an active role in shaping the foundational policies of post-war American foreign policy. He earned national attention and praise for his courage and integrity in standing up to the attacks by the Republican right wing, then as now filled with idiots and um, 
Joe McCarthy during the battle over his confirmation to be Ike's ambassador to the Soviet Union. Finally, it did not hurt that he was good company, combining intelligence with wit and a love of good conversation and had a charming wife. Let me begin with just very briefly a few facts about his career. He was born in Clayton, New York in 1904 to a quintessentially WASP family. After graduating from Harvard in 1927, he drifted more by happenstance than avocation into a foreign service that was a third the size of what it is today, reflecting both the unimportant role of the United States in world affairs, as well as its own lack of interest. We had few diplomatic missions overseas, and it was not until the Rogers Act of 1924 that diplomats were even paid a salary, a crucial consideration for Boland. After two years in the Foreign Service, he applied to study Russian under a recently created State Department program and spent the next three years at the School of, International, of Oriental Languages in Paris, because at that time there was no place in the United States where he could do this. He became fluent by spending two summers in a row with an emigre Russian family in Estonia, whose endearing eccentricities encouraged a lifelong affinity for the company of Russians. At the end of 1933, Boland cut short his studies to join the new US Embassy in Moscow under William Bullock, FDR's newly appointed ambassador to the Soviet Union. He returned to Moscow for a second tour in 1938 at the height of Stalin's purges and as war clouds were gathering in Europe. In late 1940, he was posted to Tokyo where he was interned with the rest of the embassy after Pearl Harbor in December 1941. After six months, he was finally able to return home uh, through a long circuitous journey. When he joined the Soviet desk in the State Department in the summer of 1942, Allied fortunes were at their lowest ebb, both in the Pacific and in Europe. A year after attacking Russia in, 19, in June 1941, Hitler appeared poised to occupy Southern Russia and the Caucasus. Everything depended on Russia's ability to hold out. But so the Soviet armies were victorious at Stalingrad and Kursk. And by mid-1943, Allied victory was very much in sight and thoughts turned to shaping the post-war peace. Boland got his lucky break when U.S. Secretary of State Cordell Hull met with his British and Soviet counterparts in Moscow in October 1943, and Boland was assigned to be his interpreter. Unbeknownst to him, this was a trial run to see if he was good enough to interpret for FDR at his upcoming meeting with Stalin and Churchill in Tehran. He passed with flying colors, and so in November, found himself in the Iranian capital translating Roosevelt's words to Stalin in their first historic encounter. After Tehran, Boland's career took off. At the conference, he had earned the trust of Harry Hopkins, FDR's closest advisor in this period, who began to rely heavily on Boland. He again interpreted for Roosevelt, when, they, when the big three next met in Yalta in January, 1945, but this time also with a role as advisor. Much had changed since Tehran. The German surrender was only months away. The Red Army's swift and brutal occupation of Eastern Europe was causing concern. Roosevelt made substantial concessions to bring Stalin into the war in the Pacific, without which the US military told him, Japan could not be defeated. Though FDR dominated the conference as he had at Tehran, it was clear that he was very ill, indeed dying, although not, in Boland's view, in any way mentally impaired. Now it was Stalin who exuded confidence and the two Western delegations left Yalta in a very gloomy mood. Four months later, FDR was dead and Harry Truman, as little prepared as any US president in history, took office. During his presidency, 
U.S. policy made a 180 degree turn from the cordiality of wartime cooperation to the full scale confrontation of the Cold War. During these years, Boland would work closely with each of Sec Truman's secretaries of state, James Burns, George Marshall, and Dean Acheson, and participated actively in all the various events and crises of this period, the Marshall Plan, the Berlin blockade, the creation of NATO, the diplomacy of the Korean War, and much else. This period probably represented the height of his influence. Under Eisenhower, as I mentioned earlier, Boland survived a bruising confirmation battle and went on to serve as ambassador to Moscow in Moscow for four years, observing at first hand the gradual relaxation that occurred after Stalin's death and the various dramas of this period, the rise of Khrushchev his dramatic speech denouncing Stalin, as well as the events of 1956 in Poland and Hungary. Boland established good relations with Soviet leaders who respected his skill as a diplomat and his knowledge of the Soviet Union. At the end of four years, John Foster Dulles, with whom Boland had less cordial relations, summarily removed him from Moscow. Boland seriously contemplated retiring, but in the end accepted the post of ambassador to the Philippines. After Dulles's death, Eisenhower brought him back to, to Washington from his exile, and he served as special advisor on Soviet affairs to Secretary of State Christian Herder during the period of, among other things, the U-2 affair and the abortive Khrushchev Eisenhower summit. After John F. Kennedy's election in 1960, the new president kept him on as advisor and highly valued his advice. Boland was in Washington for the beginning of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but then went on to serve as ambassador to de Gaulle's France for close to five years. He navigated the difficult relationship with de Gaulle with a skill and tact that the French president and his government appreciated. Returning to the State Department in 1968, he was appointed Deputy Undersecretary for Political Affairs, a position he recalled with ill-defined duties that left him underemployed. He retired in 1969 at the beginning of the Nixon administration and I'm sorry at the beginning of the Nixon administration, excuse me, and was able to complete his memoir, Witness to History Before Dying of Cancer in January, 1974. I want to focus a bit upon the, about, on the qualities that made Bolin a renowned Soviet expert. He and Kennan were the first, and they were in many respects unique because they were the first. Perhaps the first thing to say is that Bolin really liked Russians, though not, of course, Soviet Russia, and always took great enjoyment and pleasure in their company. His views of the Soviet Union really came out of his three-year training course in Paris and his two tours in Moscow in the 1930s. His training made him not only fluent in Russian, but gave him a thorough grounding in history and culture. During his first tour in Moscow, it was still possible for American di diplomats and to meet Russians of all, of all kinds. And Boland met a lot of people from ballerinas to theater people to top members of the Russian Politburo. This was a brief and memorable period of relative freedom in Soviet history that would not be repeated in Boland's experience of Soviet affairs. But it, it left lasting memories of a Russia for whose people and culture, both he and Kennan, also in the embassy at that time, retained a lasting affection. It was also during this Moscow tour that Boland developed his life, lifelong fascination with the phenomenon of Russian, of Soviet communism. 
Kennan described him in this period as a man of exceptional native brilliance, interested both passionately and dispassionately in everything that concerned the Russian scene, a man who never ceased to throw off thoughts and ideas like sparks from a sparkler. The young diplomats in Bullitt's embassy were the first diplomats to experience Soviet Russia at first hand. At that time, the future course of the Soviet Union was still to some degree in flux. The purges were yet to come. Boland, Kennan, and their colleagues spent hours discussing what it all meant. To quote Kennan again, he, he said, never, I think, can there have been an American diplomatic mission where there was more off-duty discussion of the country to which it was accredited and the problems with which it was faced. They considered themselves duty bound through these arguments and explorations to try to understand the Soviet Union and its complex reality, and at the same time to define the implications for Soviet American relations. They shared, in the words of one of their diplomatic friends, a unanimous obsession with the Soviet Union, which Boland never lost. Indeed, according to his friend, the columnist Joe Alsop, he came perilously close to disliking any conversation that was not about his special subject. No less formative was Boland's second tour in Moscow from 1938 to 1940. It was vastly different from the first and destroyed any optimism about Russia's future that he might have felt four years earlier. Moscow was in the grip of Stalin's terror. Russians shunned any contact with foreigners. Boland witnessed the last of Stalin's great show trials, a grotesque spectacle that threw him into a deep depression. A year later, the Nazi Soviet pact provided him with an important lesson in realpolitik. This cynical deal between two ideological arch enemies demonstrated to Boland that the Kremlin was willing to put its aside its ideological beliefs in pursuit of Russia's national interests. By the end of his second tour, Boland had formulated certain core ideas about the Soviet Union that remained central to his thinking throughout his career. Having experienced Russia at, fir at first hand, he was well aware that the Soviets were not nine feet tall, that despite its formidable military might, an unmatched, intel unmatched intelligence service, and a huge propaganda machine, the Kremlin ruled over a primitive, primitive third world country. He was therefore inclined to take talk of the Soviet menace and the powerful, perfectly oiled Soviet machine with a grain of salt. Further, from the Nazi-Soviet pact, he defined for himself the three basic factors that it is that in govern govern the, the it seemed to be, seemed to be an echo. So maybe it's just to me. Sorry. From the net uh, so the, the three basic factors that in his view governed the Soviet Union's external behavior. First, Marxist Leninist ideology remained a key defining component of Soviet relations with the outside world. The Soviets looked at the West through an ideological prism. As capitalist nations, the Western democracies were by definition class enemies. The degree of hostility might ebb and flow as it did during World War II, but by definition, it could not be wished away. Ideology also gave the Soviet rulers confidence that time, the inevitable march of history were on their side. Although what Boland liked to call the ideological factor persisted to the end of the Soviet regime, it was never in his view, the main driver of Soviet actions. A conclusion that often engave, involved him in disputes with those in the US government who believed that the Kremlin was relentlessly bent on global con conquest. Boland understood secondly, that the Soviet Union would act to further Russia's traditional national goals and ambitions, as would be 
vividly demonstrated by Stalin's actions during and after World War II, if necessary, in defiance of ideology. Finally, the top priority for both Stalin and his successors was preservation of their own power and of the Soviet regime, something that all dictators have in common, maintaining their power. After World War II, maintaining control over Eastern Europe also became a core interest, second only to regime survival. In the Soviet view, the biggest threat to regime survival was a major war. War was unpredictable. World War II had nearly destroyed the Soviet regime and fear of a major war made the Soviet leadership cautious, even risk averse, reluctant to embark on risky adventures that might jeopardize their hold on power at home. The Soviet Union had too much to lose to enter rashly into a conflict where it was not certain to prevail. In short, Boland saw the Soviet Union as a power that would put its own national interests and regime survival ahead of ideology in the event that it, would, that it clashed. It would act prudently in the face of risk and opportunistically where opportunities beckoned. At the same time, the built-in ideological hostility to the West dictated that possibilities for cooperation or cordial relations would be by definition be limited and transient. The Soviet Union could never be considered just another country. Among his other qualifications as a Soviet expert, Bolin was a, an acute dispassionate observer and analyst of Soviet developments. He loved just trying to figure out what was going on. Since so much of the of what went on in the Soviet Union was concealed from public view. This meant trying to decipher clues in the Soviet press or reading the tea leaves as he called it. His friend, the philosopher Isaiah Berlin described him as very detached, cool, clear-headed, a realist, unlike Kennan who was continuously obsessed by the dreadfulness of the Soviet Union Bolin, on the other hand, was much more interested in observation, knowing what was going to happen next, what individual Soviet leaders were like, how they influenced each other, what the effect would be. It was the game that interested him, he said. In addition, Bolin's 40-year career dealing with Soviet affairs gave him a direct experience of Soviet diplomacy and Soviet diplomats that was virtually unmatched in the US government. No contemporary had as much face time with Soviet officialdom. He was by and large a shrewd behavior of, a, a shrewd judge of Soviet behavior, though by no means infallible as he would have been the first to admit. His views about the Soviet Union were really moderate and balanced. He was wary of extreme judgments. In the final analysis, so much of what made Bolin and Kennan Soviet experts was tied to their direct personal experience of the Soviet Union, something that was virtually impossible to communicate to those who had never set foot in, the so in Soviet Russia. Kennan once said that trying to explain the Soviet Union to someone who had never been there was like explaining sex to a virgin. But in many, but in Washington, there were not, those who had spent time in the Soviet Union were not numerous. And at regular intervals throughout Boland's career, he would find his views at odds with the prevailing opinion in Washington, which feared from one extreme to the other. He returned to DC in 1942 amid a huge swell of pu public sympathy for the brave Russians fighting at Stalingrad, Stalingrad. He was appalled to see that this translated into an overly benign and rosy view of the Soviets in certain parts of the US government, particularly the White House. As a diplomat friend of his put it, there are people in this town who think that the defense of Stalingrad proves there is no Soviet secret police. 
Swayed by his association with Roosevelt and Hopkins, he came to believe that some cooperation with the Russians might be possible. But he retained um, always very lucid about St what Stalin was up to. After Tehran, the high point of wartime cordiality, he wrote an uncannily prescient memo about Soviet post-war intentions which basically concluded that the end war of the end result of Stalin's intentions would be that the Soviet Union would be the only important military and political force on the continent of Europe, while the rest of Europe would be reduced to military and political impotence. In the Truman presidency, of course, the pendulum swung sharply in the other direction. As relations deteriorated between Stalin and the West, the Soviet Union was increasingly seen as a threat. Stalin responded to the Marshall Plan by unleashing a vicious campaign of violent strikes and protests in Italy and France. It was really a scary time. But Boland and Kennan, who worked very closely together during this period, challenged the increasingly prevalent idea that the Soviet Union posed a military threat that required a military response. Both would oppose the creation of NATO, arguing that this was primarily a political battle, that Stalin had no intention of invading Western Europe, that given the Europeans' urgent economic needs, their money should not be wasted on armaments. In the end, Bolin switched to support NATO because it was he felt it was necessary to reassure the Europeans, but Kennan never really changed his view. The Soviet Union's acquisition of a nuclear weapon in August 1949 intensified the Washington debate about defense and created pressures to increase the defense budget. In the famous document called NSC 68, Paul Nitzer, who would replace Kennan as head of the policy planning staff, laid out the case for a huge increase in defense. In breathless and overheated prose, he asserted that the US was up against the evil empire, quote, a slave state animated by a new fanatic faith antithetical to our own, a huge machine bent implacably on world domination and, dis and the destruction of capitalist society. While not disputing the need to increase the defense budget, Boland strongly challenged this to him mechanistic and distorted view of Soviet intentions, relying on the arguments I outlined earlier. Even though the Soviet Union viewed the world through a hostile ideological prism, it acted primarily in its interest as a national state and above all, to preserve its internal regime. The spreading of communism, in his view, took a distant second place to these national goals, and indeed was to be avoided if it meant a communist system not under Soviet control, like Tito's Yugoslavia. As far as the military threat was concerned, Bolin asserted Nitsa made the mistake of equating capabilities with intentions. In reality, the threat that Soviet Russia posed was a manageable and pragmatic one. The outbreak of the Korean War in 1950 settled the debate about the defense budget, which necessarily increased dramatically when the US entered the war, but not the argument about Soviet intentions. Bolin and Kennan believed that in Korea, Stalin was pursuing a finite one-off goal but had made a huge miscalculation in believing that the US would not intervene. What he feared most was a wider war that would bring in the US. But according to the dominant view in Washington, the attack on South Korea marked the beginning of the Kremlin's campaign for world conquest. Boland, looking back 30 years later, saw the Korean War as a major turning point that had the disastrous consequence of over-militarizing American foreign policy. Atchison, he would write, was influenced by those 
who did not know Russia. Neither Acheson nor Nitsa had ever set foot in Russia. Acheson felt that the Korean War represented a new foreign policy of military aggression. As a result of this erroneous, erroneous judgment, Bolin would write, the US overinterpreted the Korean War and overextended American commitments. The view prevailed that godless communism had conspired to take over the world and that the US was the knight in shining armor who would fight it everywhere. Later during the Eisenhower administration, Bolin would also find the same lack of receptivity for his views on the Soviet Union, although for different reasons. Arriving in Moscow soon after Stalin's death, he quickly perceived that things were changing. Significant relaxation was underway in both eternal and external Soviet policy. But he was unable to convince Dulles that these changes were real or significant or that the US should take advantage of these trends to at least enter into a dialogue with the Soviet leadership. He failed to make a dent in Washington's conviction that Stalin's death offered a heaven sent opportunity to step up its propaganda offensive and increase pressure on the regime. Meanwhile, Dulles who regarded communism as immoral continued the militarization of US foreign policy by creating anti-Soviet military alliances all around the world. Well, I could say, I've talked a lot, I could say a lot more about the Eisenhower years and I, I wanna leave plenty of time for questions. I just wanna emphasize that I discussed the Bolin nitsa dispute in some detail because this argument kept recurring again and again uh, during the Cold War between those who thought that that the Soviet Union was a rational, if dangerous, adversary with legitimate national interests against those who saw this unthinking machine relentlessly pursuing world conquest or, or nuclear superiority. Uh, it pitted those who believed we should consider the, the, this quarrel about intentions versus capabilities. And there's, there's a lot that could be said about this. This opens up a whole other field of discussion. But, but just I, as far as Bolin was concerned, it really showed that although his views were very much valued by both Acheson and Nietzsche, Nietzsche, both of them were his friends, but all his expertise was powerless to change a mindset that in my view arose as much out of domestic politics as it did from real world events. So thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Thank you greatly. Um, that was a wonderful tour of an extraordinary life. Um, as we start to open it to questions, I wonder though, if you come a little bit later in his career, and comment on what his views were during the, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. That seems to be one of those turning points that he would have been very engaged in discussing. Yes, well, as it happened, um, I, um, he was there for the beginning of it. And he was asked, um, he was scheduled to leave for Paris to be, where he was gonna be ambassador. Um, so he, um, um, and Kennedy asked him to stay and Bo, uh, my father originally said, yes, he would. And then he thought it over and he thought this would, if I postpone my departure, this will tip off the, the Soviets uh, that something is up. At that time, the whole thing was still very, very secret. And um, besides um, Ambassador Llewellyn Thompson was there and um, would play a very important role. And so he, I think to Kennedy's regret, but he, he thought it was better that he should go. So he was not there for the denouement, but I think his views um, would have been very much very close to Ambassador Thompson's, which was to, you know, to always give the the Soviets a way out of this crisis. And I think he, you know, he certainly would have been opposed to 
um, using using force without having exhausted all the all the peaceful possibilities that existed, which were the ones that that played out and saved it from it really coming to a head. Mm -hmm. Questions? Um, hands? Uh... Yes, Stephanie. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, please. Sorry about that. Um, Avis, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your experience, um, where you were at some of these key points in your father's career and how it impacted you as a child and as a young, um, a young person. Yes, well, I was, um, I, I, until I was um, in college and even then I went everywhere that my, my parents were, but that the first place I went was when he was, I didn't mention this, but he was, um, he was um, the number two in the Paris embassy from 1949 to 1951. And so I went with them and they plunged me into a French school for which I've been eternally grateful. And amusingly, it, it was a house that the embassy had just bought, a wonderful house with a garden. And, um, they, um, when I, I came back in the same position that my father had had several decades later and I occupied the same house, which was mm. <laughs> What a wonderful experience. What a, yes. What and a then I was in Moscow um, with them, not, not the whole time they were there. I went away to boarding school in the US, but um, I spent a fascinating year with them. It was, um, they, after Stalin's death, when uh, under Stalin, diplomats had not been able to travel, and um, um, and they were after he died, they lifted a lot of the restrictions. So my parents traveled, took advantage to travel a lot, and we went to places. We, my mother had a passion for Russian churches, and so we, <laughs> you know, the local conservator would take us around. And we were probably the first foreigners they'd seen since World War II. Mm. And it, they were they all were always thrilled. And that was that was just a wonderful as I, I think I tried to convey, I think human contact with ordinary Russians is always, always a wonderful experience. And then I was also in the Philippines, which was interesting. And I, when my father was ambassador to France, I was, I was there also. When he left for the Cuban Missile Crisis, he obviously, he and my mother left me with my younger sister um, in, uh, who was in school. And of course he couldn't say anything about it. And I picked up the newspaper one morning and there were the headlines about, you know, Soviet missiles in Cuba and everybody was very, worried about whether war would break out. And I thought, what the heck do I do? My sister's here, my parents are on the high seas. I didn't even know that my father knew about this, but uh, yeah, so I profited fully from, from my father's career. <laughs> and obviously it must have been, um, it was part of your own decision about about your career and your life? Oh, I mean, ultimately not right away. I didn't go into the foreign service right after college. And um, it, it was only much later when I was working in arms control that I realized what interested me was not counting widgets and for an arms control agreement, but uh, really the politics of it. And I, um, so at, the, at that time they offered a, um, a lateral entry program to bring more women into the foreign service. And I came in that way and I, I've never regretted, but I, I didn't go into the foreign service when I graduated from college, because at that time um, they were not, uh, uh, women were not allowed to stay if they got married. So since I planned to get married, I thought I would, uh, <laughs> The intermediate step. Kathy Truex has a question. She's had her hand up patiently. No, Kathy. 
Okay. Aha, Frank Castigliola. Oh. Yeah, hi. I um I apologize. I wasn't able to uh to get on this. I don't know, it was a problem with the password until about halfway in, Ava. So I sorry I missed it. I have two questions. One, um, how you I know you're working a biography of your father. Yes. About the progress of that. And second, I'm wondering, you know, your father became obviously ambassador to the Soviet Union after Kennan had to suddenly leave after his declared persona non grata. I was wondering what your father's opinion was of Kennan's performance in Moscow. Oh, me too. Um, well, I think he was really kind of um, stunned by, by um, Kennan's, um, you know, lack of judgment in saying what he, what he did um, in, in the Berlin airport. I mean, just for, um, to recollect what happened, he was asked by, um, by reporters when he came to, when he landed in Berlin, what, what he felt, um, how he felt about life in, in Moscow. And it was still high Stalinism when he was there and he had a pretty miserable, lonely time of it, I think, on, on many occasions. And so he said, well, it reminded me of being interned in, in Germany during the war. And this was just, um, you know, the comparison was perhaps apt, but the, the Soviet leadership, I mean, Mikoyan was one of the long, longer lasting Soviet leaders, um, um, said to my father, you know, we, we just could not overlook this. In Berlin, in Berlin itself, in Samen Berlin, he said this, he compared us to, to Nazi Germany. And um, I'm, I mean, I don't, I've not seen, we, we have lots of transcripts of the Politburo meetings now, but I haven't seen one about that, but it'd be interesting to know how they debated about that. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, it was, a, it was a really tough time in Soviet American relations, the last years of Stalin, uh, there was always the German question and Stalin's proposal of 1952. And it was just a really sterile period of sort of trading, uh, you know, very um, routine propaganda back and, back and forth. And, and uh, Kennan, as you know, had a very, was not, was not happy. It was not a happy experience for him for, for many reasons. And thank you, Frank, for asking about my book. I remember the help you you have given me over the years, and I'm sorry to say it's not still still not finished, but it's um, it's getting there. I would say <laughs> I'm all the way up. I've just completed my father's period as ambassador, but it's it's such a it's such a fascinating um, subject. I I really enjoyed working on it. So thank you for. Joining us. Uh, Alex Ross has a hand up, I believe. Yes, th thank you so much, Avis. This is so informative. I want to um, focus for a minute on the intelligence component, the intelligence services, right? I know in popular culture, we, we feel that the intelligence services played such a large role during that time. So uh, to what extent was the US intelligence service for your father a force that he had to compete with in terms of his uh, role vis-a-vis uh, -vis his, um, his leadership in the United States? And to what extent did the Soviet intelligence service present a challenge for him in getting his work done? Um, well, I think with regard to the First, it was the CIA sort of a competitor in reporting back to Washington. I think that was nowhere near the problem that it later became. I don't even think that the CIA had people in the embassy. I don't, you know, I don't know. I assume they had some assets in the Soviet Union, but probably my father didn't even know about them. And um, 
Um, so I, it, I think it was much more of a problem with him for him when he was ambassador to Paris. And I can remember there, he talked about having discussions with Bobby Kennedy to, to diminish the number of, um, of um, CIA people down, down. From, from what it was. He just, he really already, already foresaw that they would begin to play an outsized role in, in US embassies uh, overseas. And he was very proud that he'd negotiated the number down. As far as the Soviet um, intelligence was concerned, um, he, you know, you just assumed that they were watching you every minute, um, even in the, even though he went there after Stalin's death, it was several years before uh, Soviets felt comfortable talking to him. He described having run into somebody in the, um, in the theater whom he'd known in the 30s. And she turned her back, you know, she recognized him and saw that he recognized her and she turned her back to give a signal that he should not approach her. And, and uh, so contact was still very limited. Um, they assumed that the embassy was, was bugged. Um, they, they assumed that um, uh, they were followed everywhere, although not as conspicuously as they had been under Stalin. And it was just um, it was just a fact of life. Um, he never did. Um, I mean, they never would have bothered him unless he did something that the Soviet government wanted to punish him for, and that that didn't happen. I think one one time when he got kind of indirectly involved. Well, I would say two things. First, that the the Marines in the embassy were constantly getting into trouble and they would be, you know, they would have girlfriends and then they would be compromised by the, um, by the, by the um, NKVD. And um, my father's policy was to get them out of there in 24 hours. Um, a more prominent case was his friend, Joe Alsop, who was, um, even though this was not widely known at the time, but he was, um, he was gay. And he, um, the secret police put somebody onto him and took pictures and, um, and uh, then tried to compromise him. And he went to my father who was a good friend and, and uh, Boland said, you, you need to get out of here within the next 24 hours. And, and also said, oh, I have all these wonderful appointments. And, and Boland said, just get out. <laughs> And of course, this became known in, in Washington later, but, uh, but there were always instances of that. They were always trying to compromise people. Thank you. Ellen Frost has got a hand up, I think. Uh, thanks, Avis. Um, I wondered what your father thought of FDR. He had uh, access to, after all, this remarkable president. And I wonder if, Specifically, he criticized FDR for relying too much on personal charm in thinking he could turn Stalin around. And specifically, um, the Polish issue seemed to be a, an example of the failure of FDR to persuade Stalin to um, stay out of Poland, in effect. Um, I may be well, misinterpreting the history, but I wondered if if you if he commented on any of that. Well, I think that your question really has two parts. The first was um, what Boland thought of the of FDR's relations with the with the Russians, and he was he was quite quite critical. I think he admired Roosevelt as a great leader who had. Um, who had brought the U.S. out of the depression and won the war, and he admired his great leadership qualities. But he gave him barely passing marks in foreign affairs. He said he never prepared for his meetings. He never bothered to read the briefing books. Well, I mean, nobody reads the State Department briefing books. We all know that. But um, 
but um, uh, you know, he did. He really was kind of he because he really had this vanity about his own personal magnetism, which was which was considerable. And um, I think he overrated it with with Stalin. Um, he was he was also he was in FDR was an extremely cynical man, and I don't think he people have said he was naive about Stalin. He wasn't naive about Stalin. He knew exactly um, what he was dealing with, but he was he was um, he was vain about his personal abilities to you know to influence people. And it is not false to say that he established a special relationship with, with Stalin. Stalin was, um, I mean, I've heard the, the biographer of uh, the three volume bi uh, biography of Stalin, um, Steve Kotkin say that he felt Stalin really felt affection for, um, for Roosevelt and felt, um, you know, showed emotion when he when he died um and but he it didn't deflect him from his goals which were to get control of of um of of eastern europe and to establish a kind of buffer zone around um as to poland i think it would be wrong to say that fdr didn't didn't do what he could for poland but but poland by the time of yalta was already under Soviet occupation, and they were within weeks of uh, announcing a, a puppet government. And um, and they had a there was a huge discussion at, at Yalta, a very you know dramatic one, and Churchill waxed uh, waxed eloquent. But um, what they got was was very very little. It was an agreement that they would be allowed to watch um, the elections, and um, Stalin was not going to give up control. And at the end of the day, um, Roosevelt said, "I've done all I can for for Poland," and the fight went on for some time until. You know, and they and the Soviets wouldn't let the they wouldn't let election observers in, and they didn't live up to the very small pledges that they that they had made. But um, I I think it would be wrong to say that that FDR could have done more than he did for for Poland. Not I mean that didn't stop the people you know critics from saying that he that he had. But he had 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 sort of given up. Amos, would you comment on uh, your time in Bulgaria as the ambassador, and what at that point Bulgarians were saying about the Stalin era? Well, by the time I. Um, Got to Bulgaria, of course. They, um, the communism had ended, and they were were in a very, um, um, a very sort of unstable transition, which eventually brought a, a center right government to to power, and they they embarked on a sort of Western oriented course. Um, they. I, it depended who you talked to. I, I mean, Stalin, in particular. I the I knew people who'd been on the wrong side of the communist government. They'd been um, they'd been um, blue, as they called them, and their their families. I, the The takeover of Bulgaria by the Bulgarian communists was the bloodiest of all in Eastern Europe, and they really. They took people to the edge of a ravine and pushed them over. They sent them to, to farms where they didn't have enough to live. It was very bloody and it was very brutal. So those who were on the wrong side of the political divide were, um, were understandably very bitter and they detested the, the communists. Um, there were others. Bulgaria was sort of a, a favored member of um, the Warsaw Pact. They um, 
they derived most of their um, income from selling agriculture to the Soviet Union. And that all fell to pieces after the end of communism. And I think it, and it took a long time for it to get going again. So when I was there, people still remembered the communist era as a time when they had, um, they had full, full employment and their pensions were not devalued. And it, it was, I think the transition was tough for a lot of people as it was, uh, as it was in most of Eastern Europe. Yeah. Other questions? If not, well, Avis, thank you for a wonderful uh, discussion. Um, I'm sure we're all looking forward to the time when your book is finished and we can- Not as much as I, as I am. <laughs> <laughs> and do remember to join us on the 13th of December for a little holiday Renaissance music. Thank you all, be safe. Good night. Thank, Thank you, Davis. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.